Right. In our uh, discussion of the first hundred lines of the Rape of the Lock, we had seen how Pope introduces the poem that uh, in the epistle dedicatory to uh, Arabella Fermer, he talks about how the poem is an intent to laugh the quarrel out of court, he talks about good sense and good humor. He talks about uh, the machinery, the epic machinery that he will use in the poem. In the invocation, he talks about the difference between uh, amorous things and dire offenses. He talks about his muse as being Carol. And he talks about the poem being sophisticated artifice, even if the subject matter be trivial. So Pope then proceeds to do a simultaneous art of trivializing the epic through the mock heroic, feminizing the epic by transferring the masculine ethos of the epic to the inner world of Belinda and the woman. And he also, in a certain sense, aestheticizes it by transferring the martial valor of the epic into uh, the more feminine, delicate uh, objectification of the female world. Now, we will follow this uh, tradition and we will see how we will look at Belinda's dressing table in the toilet scene in this particular episode. And we'll see this as one of the best examples of the operation of the mock heroic in The Rape of the Lock, where the simultaneous trivialization, feminization, and aestheticization operates, as well as look as two of the themes in the poem, one, the variety of uh, female selfhoods that Pope seeks to present. And secondly, very importantly, within the toilet scene, we will see the, uh, the effect or the celebration of colonization that Pope seeks to undertake. So it is with this forward that I take up the uh, next or the conclusion of the first canto. You see, and of course, we have already referred to Ariel and the uh, sylphs and the way in which Pope creates a hierarchy in which different kinds of women become different airy substances or elemental substances after their death. And the sylphs are the cockets, the unmarried women who have flirted, who have enjoyed their life uh, basking in the glory of the attention of the, of the men and therefore have become tiny uh, elf-like creatures who hover around in the air, guarding Belinda's chastity. So the primary aim of the sylph is to guard Belinda's chastity, or the chastity of young women. And then he says, of these am I who thy protection claim, a watchful sprite spirit, and Ariel is my name. Late as I rang the crystal wise affair, in the clear mirror of thy ruling star, I saw, alas, some dread event impend, ere to, main, ere to the main this morning sun descend. Now this has a mock heroic parallel. This is a mock heroic parallel to the epic custom of the foreboding. That is to say, the epic uh, custom of impending doom. Now, an example of this would be from the Enid. The Enid, where just before the sacking of, the Tro of Troy, the ghost of Hector appears to Enos, uh, warning him to escape. Right. So the warning, the epic warning of impending doom, the epic warning of impending doom is here transferred to the mock heroic warning of 
something dire going to happen. Now, what you are observing here is a very careful act of substitution. The mock heroic, as you saw, is an act of substitution and denigration, whereby every single epic detail is given a trivial context and thereby the laughter is generated from our identification of the difference between the high and the epic uh, proportion versus the mock heroic lack of proportion, as it were, the mock heroic decline or fall. So I had mentioned it's a series of crests and troughs. So the crest here is the warning of Hector to Aeneas, which will result in a civilizational conflict versus the warning that something dire is going to happen to Belinda's lock. That is, a lock is going to be cut off by Lord Peter. So this is where the epic parallel lies. Warned by the heir to the main, this morning sun descends. So before the evening, something dire is going to happen. Obviously, you will remember that the entire action of the rape of the lock takes place from morning to afternoon of one particular day. Warned by the sylph, O oh, pious maid, beware. Now, once again, please remember that there is always Pope sort of uh, mixing the sacred and the profane here. But you see, Belinda's dressing herself at her toilet or her dressing table is going to be like a sacred ritual. And Belinda will be referred to as the pious maid. Now, why is this significant? Because it adds to the satire. You know, pride or vanity is considered to be one of the seven deadly sins from which Belinda suffers. Narcissistic pride. Now, therefore, when Pope is referring to her as the pious woman, who is actually flirting around, circulating her desires. This word of the pious, this word pious, is adding to the satire that Belinda is nothing but pious. So, O pious maid, beware. This to disclose is all thy guardian can. Beware of all, but most beware of man. So once again, that epic warning is rendered into the mock heroic <coughs> warning of beware of all, but most beware of man. He said, when shock, who thought she slept too long, shock is the lap dog. Now, this is very interesting in the way in which certain Oriental and European objects filled up the 18th century, uh, what you can call social world of this there would be the West Indian slave or the boy, uh, the, the colored boy slave, for example. Also, very frequently, ladies would have the Icelandic lap dog. Almost, uh, if you have, if any of you have a Spitz dog back home, uh, shock uh, would be that lap dog, the Icelandic lap dog who's, who had lots of fluffy hair on its body and who would be petted by the uh, aristocratic Belinda. So aristocratic ladies would have, you know, uh, dogs as their, uh, as their pets, as it were. Please remember that this is a lady's lap dog. The other men would obviously, the aristocratic men would obviously have hounds, which would, you know, hunt the foxes. So even in the choice of dogs, there's a very, uh, kind of a gendered um, choice in the sense that the lap dog is what Belinda is, uh, uh, is petting. And shock awakens Belinda from her sleep. Uh, shock, who thought she, she slept too long, leapt up and waked his mistress with his tongue. Then, it was then Belinda, if reports say true, 
Thy eyes first opened on a billet doux. Now, a billet doux is a love letter, right? A love letter, an amorous love letter. A love letter obviously would involve a lot of, uh, you know, uh, expression. You know, uh, the writing of a love letter obviously is uh, also an art which was greatly practiced during this age. Uh, uh, of course, later on in our ages too. Unfortunately, with the advent of the mobile phone and your SMS and WhatsApp messages, the craft of writing a love letter has uh, completely been lost. Now, there are numerous tales and films where, you see, the love letter, writing of the love letter is an art with which the woman falls in love with. If you remember the film Sajan, for example, there is a Madhuri Dixit falling in love with the love letter itself rather than the, uh, ma uh, or the man who love writes the love letters. And uh, th that is what creates a complication in the film. Now, I I'd just like to add to a small anecdote here. You know, when I was in college, uh, you know, I was a champion of writing love letters. In fact, the writing of a love letter has a certain structure, if you know, that uh, you first praise the beauty of the girl, then you confess how she stole your breath away, and then you talk about the degree of love that you have for the, for the woman. So, and then you, you talk about the future and what might happen if this love is, as it were, uh, reaches its completion. And uh, very often I uh, was hired by people to write their love letters with uh, the prize being probably a dosa and a, and a cold drink at a nearby cafe. Now, this is the art which Pope will refer to. And this is the billet doux, which is uh, uh, the French were supposed to be much more erotic, much more passionate than the English. The English love letter was considered to be a little mm, what you call dry, whereas the French would be the better love letter writer. Right. So just then Belinda, if reports say true, thy eyes first opened on a billet doux. Now, uh, once again, you see this element of the sacred and the profane and Belinda's, the state of Belinda's mind that she's always thinking about love Amor, eroticism, yet she's refusing to uh, sort of submit herself in marriage. Now, you see, this question of the woman's erotic, passionate feeling was something that patriarchy would always be very anxious about, especially uh, the nobility. Why? Because, you see, of this question of fate, of lineage. Now, inheritance, if you remember, who would get the property was based on this idea of primogeniture. What was primogeniture? It went to the first born, right? The others would get some property maybe, but the bulk of the property would go to the first born. Therefore, if you had illicit children, bastard children, as it were, it could create numerous problems in uh, in the inheritance, you just have to think about a play like King Lear, where the bastard child causes mayhem in society. So, the you know, only the woman's chastity could ensure that the child belonged to the father and the child was not a bastard child. So, in that sense, you know, the woman's sexuality had to be curbed through marriage. It had to be controlled through marriage. Therefore, the single woman who flirts and who can radiate sexuality, especially female sexuality, is something which the patriarch would see with a great degree of suspicion. Right. So Pope is here very critical that Belinda, the young girl's mind, is filled only with ideas of boys and love. So in a certain sense, even when Pope is 
praising the world of Belinda, making the world of Belinda very beautiful, as we will say, is obliquely critiquing Belinda that all she thinks is about her own appearance and about uh, you know, circulating, flirting with men. So it is desire that fills her soul. Therefore, when she wakes, the first thing that she looks upon is a biledu. Boons, charms, and orders were no sooner read. So that's why I was talking about the art of writing the love letter. You know, wound. So the beginning of the love letter would be with how, you know, the, the woman has wounded the heart, how the heart has been fatally, you know, wounded by the beauty of the woman. Then would be the charm, the description of the appearance of the woman, a chance. And then would come the ardor or the passion of the man. So you see, the love letters structure there is determined for you. If you want, you could actually try and follow uh, Pope, uh, in the footsteps of Pope in how to write a love letter and structure it according to that format. Wounds, charms, and others were no sooner read, but all the vision, the warning that something dire was going to happen vanished from thy head. And then comes the most important part of Canto One, the toilet scene. Now, the toilet is, of course, the kind of a dressing space for the woman. It would often be a small, uh, you know, segregated space where you had would have the mirror and the various items of makeup which would be put in different silver containers. Remember, we are talking about the aristocracy. Now, the looking glass also would be a Belgian looking glass very often because, you know, Belgium produced the finest glasses and they were often, London became a center for the sale of such Belgian glasses. So now unveiled, the toilet stands displayed. Now the parallel here is once again to the Iliad where uh, Homer describes in great detail Achilles putting on his armor. And this very act of putting up of the armor inspires awe. It is the ultimate expression of Achilles' masculinity that Achilles will put on the shield, he will put on the armband, he will put on the breast armor, and he will put on the headgear. So each of these details, as it were, are mimicked by Belinda in the ritual of the dressing of the woman. You see, there are two rituals which Pope is going to compare this to. One is the epic, masculine, martial ritual of putting on the armor before going to battle. And the second would also be the ritual dressing of the priest. Remember the vestry where the robe is kept for the priest. And before he sort of steps into the pulpit, he will uh, he will dress from the vestry and put on the garb, the, the robe, the sacred robe. So once again here, you will find that there is an element of ritual involved, but there's also simultaneously the kind of uh, coalescence, mixture, uh, coming together of the sacred and the profane. Now the mock heroic operates between the contrast between the martial dressing of the epic man versus the comic dressing of the female woman. And if the priest puts on the vest, the, the, the kind of a robe to divest himself of selfhood and become the part of the congregation, then Belinda, by virtue of the dressing, is only putting on her pride. So there's a moral contrast as well as a mock heroic contrast in this case. You have to understand this, that when Pope is bringing together the sacred and the profane, there's a moral criticism, but there's also laughter, very sophisticated laughter at the contrast between the masculine epic dressing versus the feminine dressing at the toilet. Right. And you will understand, of course, that this is where the aestheticization 
trivialization and very importantly, feminization of the epic tradition is happening. Right. So, and now unveiled the toilet stands displayed, each vase in mystic order laid. Now, very soon in one of my lectures, I'm going to show you these objects, right? The objects which would, uh, the vases which would, uh, these are small uh, silver containers which would have makeup, right? First robed in white, the nymph intent ado. Now, once again, note that silver vase in mystic order laid. Once again, see how Pope is uh, sort of completely uh, enveloping this process of the of the dressing of the woman in an epic ritual form, the, by uh, epic and religious ritual form. So once again, it is the profane becoming the sacred in that sense of the term. First robed in white, the nymph intent adores with head uncovered the cosmetic powers. So, you know, it is as it were these powers of the of the cosmetics of the makeup has an ability to transform just as the uh, holy water has this power to bring the dead to life similarly you know the cosmetic powers have the power to bring the uh, the mundane to the sublimely beautiful so Pope is here, as it were, consecrating the art of makeup as a kind of a supreme transforming act, right? So when you make up all the young uh, women who are listening in to this, uh, to this presentation, remember the Pope is suggesting that a woman can transform herself if she makes herself up properly. A heavenly image in the glass appears. Now, I, I have always tried to emphasize that even when Pope is critiquing the moral muddle within Belinda, uh, the fact that all she can think about is men and her own beauty, Pope is never very cruel on her. There is always a degree of, uh, there's always a degree of sympathy, of admiration for Belinda's beauty. Remember, that Belinda is forever presented as a kind of a sublimely beautiful woman. You have already seen oped those eyes that must eclipse the day. So persistently, Pope is comparing Belinda's beauty to an epic beauty. See, there's an art of undercutting, that the martial epic is undercut in the feminine world. But that does not mean that the feminine world is ordinary. Pope makes Belinda's beauty and her world extraordinarily beautiful in its own way. And that is where there is an epic aestheticization in, the, in Belinda's world. In fact, no other, and I, I, am, I state this with some conviction, in no other mock heroic epic do we have a world of such great beauty. So the craft of the poem, as Pope has already claimed, is not mean. It is extremely, extremely subtle and sophisticated. So a heavenly image in the glass appears. To that she bends and to that her eyes she rears. The inferior priestess at her altar side, see how once again the dressing table is compared to an altar the sacred and the profane, the ritualistic is invoked. The inferior priestess, who is this inferior priestess? This is Betty, the maid who is helping her make up. Uh, at her altar side, trembling begins the sacred rites of pride. Now, I have, I will always talk about this coexistence of the sacred and the profane. Interesting irony here because the sacred rites of pride, pride which is a cardinal sin, and pride in her own beauty. So Belinda is not concerned with the sacred acts of God. For her, she is God. Now, once again, this refers to 
very clearly the mass the the myth of narcissus if you remember narcissus who was in love with his own image and who was therefore transformed into a flower now the story of narcissus has a tragic undertone to it but narcissus has become a symbol of self absorption of self pride and belinda in this poem and by default all young women are narcissistic in that they are forever uh, you know enveloped in their own self pride right so this is something that uh, i i would like to draw your attention to uh, in fact uh, this entire episode is uh, an act of how belinda's self pride is manifested just give me a second will you switch on right so to that she uh, trembling begins the sacred rites of pride unnumbered treasures ope at once and here the various offerings of the world appear and now begins a passage which i think is very significant because here the sacred and the profane is now replaced by the political and the colonial in the sense that the objects in belinda's dressing table are all brought from different parts of the world through colonial enterprise so belinda's dressing table becomes a kind of a miniature colonial universe where or miniature english nation where all the exploitations of the colonial world congregate the various offerings of the world appear so the english monarch as it were becomes the kind of deity to whom uh, the colonial world offers its resources so in a certain sense you see what is happening here is that very subtly pope has transformed a mock heroic poem into a celebration of the beauty and richness of colonialism from each she nicely culls with curious toil you know culling is is an art of cutting right and therefore you will observe here how very subtly the elements of violence cutting exploiting extracting are embedded into what is apparently an innocent moment of makeup now pope's rape of the lock is a poem that has a deep undercurrent of violence not only in the rape of the lock as such the violation of the female body but also in the objects that strew belinda's dressing table they are all culled they are all brought with violence from the colonial world pope is aware of the violence of colonialism but he celebrates the english prosperity and the english uh, you know you can say uh, wealth that this brings to belinda's dressing table so in that sense i am going to argue that belinda's dressing table is a microcosm of this uh, colonial universe so and decks the goddess with the glittering spoil once again the spoil the loot of war and colonialism as pope realizes is a looting is a bringing all the resources exploiting all the resources from another world so you see those words culling toiling a uh, spoil all refer to pope's awareness of the violence that the process of colonialism Uh, engaged in this casket india's glowing gems unlocks now please remember this casket india's gems glowing gems unlocks so the best diamonds for example would of course be brought from india and what better example than the kohinoor which the british looted from the peacock throne uh, once again you see india was famous for its gems and its precious stones so belinda's you know necklaces are all brought from india 
and all Arabia breeds from yonder box. So this is the hole for the part, the cynic docic, as it were, where uh, Arabia, which was famed for its perfume, is uh, is on Belinda's dressing table. So almost the entire Arabia is caged in that perfume, uh, in that in that bottle of perfume that Belinda uses. So you see, once again, what is happening is Asia, South Asia, from where in from India comes the gems, from east uh, from the other part of Asia, from you can say the uh, the Western Asiatic part comes the perfumes of Arabia. Uh, the tortoise here and the elephant unite. Now this refers to the hair clips and the combs. Now the clips which were used by women to create their, to sort of decorate their hair or to tie up their hair were all made from tortoise shells. Once again, exotic tortoise shells taken from India. And of course, ivory. Ivory was one of the most precious objects from both Africa and India, the tusks of the elephants. And the combs would very often be made from ivory. So you have India's gems, tortoise shells, and elephants. And you will remember that you know tiger hunting and elephant hunting was a great colonial sport. You know, the sahibs would go hunting for elephants and tigers, and tiger skins and elephant tusks would be traded in the colonial market. So it is as it were, Belinda's dressing table is apparently innocent. It has clips, it has coons, very precious ones, gems, but all of them refer to the violent acquisition done through colonialism. So here files of pins extend their shining rows, pups, powders, patches, bibles, billet doux. Now please remember, this is a line of great satire. Right, so puffs. What are the puffs? The puffs of powder that she ap applies on her face. Now powder, once again, is something which... Uh, stops the sweating, so powders. But this has its epic parallel in the gunpowder, which would be used during uh, the wars. Puffs, powders, patches. In fact, uh, elbow patches would be worn by the uh, great warriors, the great classical warriors. And instead, uh, Belinda's patches are the facial patches that she wears to uh, make her makeup all the more better. Puffs, powders, patches. So she's putting on the mascara. She's putting on all the creams that she can to make herself more beautiful. This is an act of making herself up. At the same time, this has reference to the epic hero dressing himself up through elbow patches, through uh, the use of various kinds of armor. So the masculine armor is here replaced by the feminine makeup. So puffs, powders, patches, bibles. Interestingly, you will remember that great heroes very often took certain books with them to the battlefield. You remember Alexander the Great, for example, taking uh, Plato's Republic with him as a kind of a text which you would very often read. Uh, the crusaders, the knights, uh, would, very, would almost always carry the Bible to battle as the text that they could fall back upon. And on Belinda's dressing table, there is a Bible. But side by side with the Bible is the love letter, the billet doux. So, that line, puffs, powders, patches, bibles, is a climax. Puffs, powders, patches, bibles, the sacred. And then comes the bethos, bile du. So within Belinda's moral world, the bible and the bile du, the love letter and the bible, the erotic and the sacred, the sacred and the profane, 
have the same kind of a value. This is what is referred to as Belinda's moral muddle. This is a line of devastating satire. Pope is suggesting that in the world of the young woman, there is the sacred and the profane both existing at the same time, that Belinda pays no attention to devotion, sacrifice of the Bible. Instead, she's engrossed in her own self-pride, in her own beauty. Therefore, that is a line which shows the moral muddle within Belinda. And that is a line through which even within all this great beauty, Pope satirizes her pride and narcissism and her self-absorption. So you see, somebody amongst you asked why this is a Horatian satire. And my answer is that you can see what Pope is doing. Pope is never allowing the laughter to be ridiculous. You know, he's sympathetic towards Belinda, adding great aesthetics to the poem, substituting the heroic for the not heroic, creating a kind of a commodity fetishism where there are numerous objects in on Belinda's dressing table and yet then slipping in the satire also. So there's laughter, there's satire, there's beauty and there's the mock heroic, all of which is coexisting in a state of medley. It is here that Pope is going back to the original idea of the satire as satira or a motley, a medley of different kinds of modes. Right. So this is where I think comes the climax of the, and the anticlimax, of course, of the dressing scene. So the fair each moment rises in her charms, uh, repairs, this, uh, I'm sorry, now awful beauty puts on all its arms. The reference is once again to the Iliad, where Achilles puts on his armor to be awesome and almost unbeatable, right? It is Achilles's putting on the armor is the act of the ultimate masculine assertion of bravado. In this case, Belinda's putting on the toilet, uh, uh, the, the makeup is an act of sort of uh, making herself sublimely beautiful, yet the art of making oneself up is almost always you know, narcissistic in the sense that you are forever paying attention to your own beauty. Right. So the fair each moment rises in her charms, repairs her smiles, so it's putting on, you know, makeup uh, around the lips, repairs her smiles, probably putting on some lip gloss, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, awakens every grace and calls forth all the wonders of her face sees by degrees a purer blush appear so you know it's putting on the uh, uh what do they what do they call it what you put on your cheeks to make it a little redder uh what is it called by the way uh, it's blush blush it's blush so so blush is you know it goes back to the 18th century right so sees by a degrees a purer blush arise and keener lightnings quicken in her eyes. So she's, appear, uh, she's putting on uh, uh, the kajal in her eyes so that, you know, uh, you, 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 she's drawing her eyes, as it were, so that you can, uh, with, with the sideways glance, she can uh, kill a man. So once again, you see, just as Homer's uh, Achilles is, or Odysseus puts on the armor to kill men, similarly, uh, Belinda puts on her armor, her makeup, so that she can uh, wound the hearts of man. The, here the reference is, of course, to the arrows of Cupid, which uh, Belinda will throw through her glances, to the sideways glances. The busy sylphs surround their darling care. And you see, uh, just think about it when you are making up next time before the mirror. You know, thousands of sylphs pottering around your head. Uh, these set the head, some of them are setting the headdress, putting on, uh, you know, parting the hair, and those divide the hair. Some fold the sleeve of the dress, while others plate the gown, so the gown is being pressed by them. 
and Betty's praised for labors not her own. So at the end of the makeup, uh, Belinda will of course praise Betty for having made Belinda up so beautifully. Uh, now, uh, but it is in reality the sylphs who aid her in doing so. So it's almost a beautician's manual, isn't it? The way in which Belinda is gradually made up. Now, the next time any of you go and sit in front of the mirror, think about the rape of the lock classes and the ways in which, you know, Belinda puts on her charms and her arms, as it were, and you will forever have a laugh while you are making up. Now, what has Pope done? That's my question here. Pope has, therefore, engaged in a sophisticated art of substitution, right? He has taken the rape, uh, the epic battle of Troy as the subject matter and the rape of the he a rape of Helen, substituted it with uh, the rape of the lock of Arabella Firmer and wants to laugh the matter out of quarrel. So what is a trivial incident is given an extreme epic significance and therefore the difference between the battle of the civilizations versus the battle of the families generates the ridicule and the laughter. Secondly, the entire epic world of masculinity has been replaced very, very carefully, very dexterously with the world of the feminine. And at the center of this feminine world lies the dressing table with its, uh, with its element of female self-pride uh, instead of the masculine world of bravery and putting on the arms. The third, what Pope has done is, while he satir satirizes the woman's art of self-vanity and her self-absorption and narcissism, Pope has also, you know, immensely enriched it with beauty so that the process of dressing up becomes a ritual of aesthetic sublimation in a certain way. And it is here that the poem has uh, an epic amplitude of its own. At a, at a you know, epic amplitude, Roach. There's a while it talks about a very trivial thing, you know, Matharako, that this becomes also something which is uh, blessed with a degree of greatness of beauty. So, trivialization, feminization, aestheticization. This is the craft. In the process, what Pope has also done is by suggesting that it is the colonial objects which lay in Belinda's dressing table, by suggesting that it is the colonial objects which are on Belinda's dressing table, Pope has suggested that it is the colonial spoil which is making the nation greater. So in that sense, Belinda's dressing table is a miniature England and Belinda becomes the English nation which is decked up with the spoils of empire. So you have to understand what is the approach of Pope or how does Pope look at colonialism? Does he criticize it? No. He's aware of the violence that is there. He's aware of the violence that is underlying the process of colonialism, but he celebrates it as adding to the British nation. So Pope and Defoe, these are the two authors, Robinson Crusoe, for example, going to an island, taking control of it and become the king and emperor of that island. That is one way of looking at colonialism. And Pope, with the dressing table and the way in which ordinary England is made sublime, and celebrating it, therefore, validates colonialism. On the obverse you have, on the other side, you have Jonathan Swift, who recognizes the degree of exploitation that the outsider is making on, on the colonized nations, because Swift himself belonged to Ireland, and he saw how English colonized the Irish. Therefore, he protests. But this dressing table scene, this toilet scene, in Belinda is an act of careful replacement of the Homeric epic by the feminized dressing table 
At the same time, it is also a replacement through colonial objects and a validation and celebration of colonization. So Pope has used the mock epic and in Canto I has introduced us to Belinda, the heroine of the text, the protagonist of the text, and the process through which she has become sublime. She has become heroic in her own right. Now, in Canto II, what we look at is Belinda's journey to the court, to Hampton Court. And it is there that we will also see how and where the sylphs matter most. But Canto II will fundamentally be about the sylphs. And of course, also we'll see how Belinda becomes a substitution for English nationhood, as it were. It is with those co these comments that I will stop sharing my screen today. And we will uh, once again, and I'll stop the recording for the time being.